without further ado, I'd like to welcome you all to virtual Huddersfield for the first session in this series of Lines of Flight, which is the research seminar series of the Research Centre Performance Practices. Uh, RECEP is a relatively new research centre at Huddersfield. It was formed of staff from the subject areas of music and theatre and performance, and it's designed to um, stimulate interdisciplinary conversations around uh, practice research and other research approaches to, um, to the performing arts, so to music, uh, drama and dance. It's an absolute delight to be able to introduce Mira Benjamin as our first speaker in this series. Uh, Dr Mira Benjamin is a Huddersfield alum. She completed her PhD um, supported by our Duncan Drew Scholarship um, in 2019 under the supervision of Professor Philip Thomas. And I had the pleasure, and it was a pleasure, of examining her PhD. Um, Mira is now uh, um, um, at the staff of Goldsmiths College University of London, um, where her research areas span a variety of topics related to embodiment, practice research, epistemology and pedagogy. She is also a very distinguished violinist um, who's worked across an amazing variety of areas of practice, including um, electronics, dance, improvisation, um, film, theatre, and even with bands including Radiohead and Goldfrapp. Um, she collaborates with composers, having resulted in around 200 premieres of new works, and she was for some time a member of the Bozzini Quartet in Canada. Um, now in the UK, she performs regularly with Apartment House, the Plus Minus Ensemble, and the Decibel Ensemble. So welcome, Mira. Um, Mira is going to talk to us uh, about Pitch in Hand. Thanks, Emily. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, please do feel free uh, once I've gone and done my little chat uh, to turn your cameras on and get involved in the discussion. It's really um, great to be back in virtual Huddersfield. I was just saying to Emily and Ben, um, Ben uh, has been a, a very influential um, figure in my practice research and Emily uh, was on my PhD examination panel and so these are two people very close to the heart of the research that I've been doing um, in the practice of music performance so it's really wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, I'm going to just share my screen which always is harder than it should be. Uh, just a second. Great. Can you see my second screen here? Yeah, that looks great, Mira. That seems fine. Great. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm going to talk today about um, two uh, interrelated uh, things, which um, are microtonality and embodied practice. Two 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 fields of work which might seem to go together kind of like oil and water, <laughs> but which um, uh, which I nonetheless somehow managed to to do some work on in my PhD and in the research projects that have come out of it in the last year. Um, so when we talk about um, microtonality and embodied practice, we're basically talking about how something like this uh, gets into a mashup with this. Um, and the the choice of order of those two images that I've shown you is is uh, important to me because it represents something of um, the epistemic trajectory of my own research and and how I've kind of uh, recentered my own body as the site of my experimentation and practice through various uh, processes involved with these things, these kind of um, areas that I'm sure everyone who's here has an intimate relationship with. Um, the one in the middle practice research being the kind of way I choose to frame the thing that I've been doing. So um, to give you a little uh, introduction outline to the project that I'll be talking about. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm packing, unpacking two terms today. Um, these terms are ubiquitous in uh, the field of string performance, which is the field of my uh, artistic practice and yet they're they're multivalent and they do need unpacking and these terms are intonation and microtonality and I, I I set out to question the relationships any relationships that might um, arise between them I also set out to explore um, intonation the first of these two terms 
as a field of embodied knowledge, which uh, is very intimately connected with um, this quote, which is at the bottom of this page, technique is embodied knowledge that structures practice. This, um, this is from the great and wonderful Ben Spatz, who I'm sure many of you are um, well acquainted with. And um, this, this idea, this premise that technique is embodied knowledge uh, became the kind of central tenet of my practice research. Um, and this project ended up uh, pro proposing what I would like to call a relational epistemology of musical pitch via various ways of modeling, describing, sounding, and ultimately knowing pitch space through this instrument, the violin, which I have here. Um, this work that I've been doing is very much uh, departing from or rooted in um, kind of phenomenological and embodied approaches to knowledge, um, you know, um, for e-cognition, which has come out of this latter embodied approach um, and has been discussed quite a lot in the last decade, the idea that cognition is these four E's, inactive, embodied, embedded, and extended. Um, the project is taking part in, in, a, in a large discourse um, involving many creative practice projects, um, which critically addresses the Cartesian premise that, to quote once again, Ben, uh, knowing is a matter of thinking rather than of doing. So it places the practice, the doing of the music, the musicking at the center of the knowledge source and, the, and, and um, holding the knowledge in this project. Um, it takes a questioning angle to the idea that um, the knowledge objects or the epistemic objects that arise from a project like this may arise within the body as well as in other discursive or semantic or representational forms. Um, and it, my project specifically was very much involved in the field of experimental music. Um, and so I, I was drawn to this idea proposed by um, Hans-Jörg Reinberger and rearticulated by Michael Schwab that knowledge can be arrived at through the idea of an experimental system, which is a system that includes both matter and discourse and, and which has the potential to result in um, what Reinberger calls ruptures from which unexpected new objects relevant to knowledge can emerge. Um, so that's kind of the, that's, that's, the, uh, that's how I position this work that I'm doing. Um, I think it's also you know, very likely that many people at Huddersfield um, are familiar with this idea of embodiment, uh, working with, with Ben in your staff and also um, that RISEP is, is very interested in this idea of embodied research and embodied practice. Um, but I think it's it's really important to my own research to articulate from the start uh, this this quote from from Ben's book, "What a Body Can Do." Um, this idea that when we're talking about an embodied practice, we are by no means talking about a distinction between mind and body, um, and that crucially, this idea of embodied and embodied practice includes all of the following words that Ben gives at the end here. It in includes uh, rationality and intellect. It includes thought and concept and it includes speech language. And that these are facets of, of embodied, these facets of embodied practice come out of this experience of the lived body. So, all right, here we go. <laughs> um, before I speak at all about intonation or microtonality or embodied practice, uh, it might be worth giving a little background to my own practice. Um, so before I came back to education and decided to do my, uh, my practice research uh, project, I was performing in uh, the Botsini String Quartet and I spent a lot of time in a group uh, here, as, as anyone who's a string player does, I spent a lot of time considering this topic of intonation. So um, intonation uh, in the context of, that I was working in, in a string quartet like this um, has a specific collection of kind of culturally imposed meanings, uh, which is probably worth just, just outlining. Um, in case anybody here isn't from a musical background, musical practice 
uh, context. So intonation, um, very general definition of intonation as I'm using that word, uh, the treatment of musical pitch in performance. Um, but more specifically, um, when we talk about intonation in a, in a string performance context, we're, we're talking about, usually we're, we're getting at this idea that there's a certain kind of exactitude of pitch relationships that we're looking for. And this is, um, this, is the this is the start of, of the introduction of a, a kind of set of external metrics that, that are sort of hovering around us uh, when we talk about intonation in string performance. As we can see from the last definition here, which is taken from the Oxford Dictionary of Music, um, very often, when, as soon as we get into a conversation about intonation, we, uh, we start implying value judgments. So this definition from the Oxford Dictionary defines intonation as the act of singing or playing in tune. Thus, we speak of a singer or instrumentalist's intonation as being good or bad. Immediately, we come up against this idea that there's a right way to do something. And then there are a bunch of other ways to do that thing, which may be less right. Um, the composer Clarence Barlow notes that definitions like these shift the focus to the terms pitch and intune, of which pitch is unproblematic. We can measure pitch as a vibration, a number of vibra vibrations per second, uh, measurable in hertz. The meaning of intune, however, could be a matter of debate. Barlow proposes what he considers to be a, a less partial definition of intonation, the judicious placement frequency. I like this definition. Um, when I think back to my, my string quartet time, um, I spent a lot of time trying to be judicious about my placement of frequency. Part of the reason for this is because the Bozzini Quartet, the ensemble that I performed with, is well known as interpreters of what's very frequently called experimental music. Uh, pardon me, uh, microtonal music, also experimental music. So. Um, when we talk about microtonal music, we're often talking about, um, for example, the extended just intonation works of James Tenney. You know, this is music that involves uh, tuning, tuning systems and tonalities that we might consider to be extended from normal. Um, and as I spent a lot of time working on pieces of music that involved, you know, ways of expressing pitch that we don't think of as being part of the normal diatonic pitch collection. Um, suddenly, I became increasingly sensitive and, and stressed out about intonation um, in, for example, a string quartet of Beethoven or Haydn. And suddenly, simple diatonic intervals seemed to pose unresolvable tuning problems and took hours of repetition and practice and rehearsal. Um, not long after I started with the Bozzini Quartet, my sort of casual annotations that I would put in my scores, these arrows, little, little indications that maybe this pitch should be tuned a little high or listen to this instrument in this, in this, in this uh, particular instance in the music, these little casual annotations were replaced with scent deviations, ratio notation. My common practice notation scores started looking like this. I started taking techniques, methods from microtonal music in an effort to in somehow, in some way reify or lock down or make concrete these implicit senses of intonation that we all as musicians have. Um, these are, these are notation strategies which are taken from what we might call microtonal music. So, okay, microtonal music, this is, um, this is a, a term which emerged in around the turn of the century um, with early significant use um, in 1912 by the theorist Maud McCarthy Mann who, who discussed Shruti's of Indian music and in general microtonal music in a, in a sort of uh, colloquial sense, microtonal music is often uh, used to refer to music that employs intervals smaller than a semitone. I, by this point of playing in the Bozzini Quartet, was, was strikingly aware that 
there were many different kinds of semitone. And so I, I was led to ask, okay, hang on a second, what kind of semitone are we talking about here? Um, other definitions of microtonal music tend to discuss the use of intervals or tuning systems that are unusual or different. So in a Western art music context, uh, any tuning system, which isn't a 12 equally tempered or 12 equal division of the octave semitone scale would be considered to be microtonal. Um, but at the same time, my, my own practice of playing the string quartet started to turn up um, problems with these definitions. Um, it's worth, it's worth, it's worth thinking about um, how a string player actually accesses pitch. So I'll just do, give you a little example here. Say I want to play uh, this sixth, G to E. And say I want to tune that intuitively. I want to find what I would call the sweet spot or the, the smooth interval, or we have a number of qualitative words that we might use to describe that tuning, uh, the, the smoothness or the brightness or the sweetness of that interval. Well, I can tune that interval in a number of ways. Um, I, can, I can adjust the bottom pitch. I can adjust the top pitch. Or I can adjust both pitches. And at some point, I'll arrive at an interval which, I, which feels to me like the right interval. Once that relationship is established, that interval can be retained at various pitch heights. And so I've given a little example here. I'll go back to my slides for a second. And just share one more time. Oops. Try that one more time. Here we go. So here you can see my first interval. I have to get the size of the interval that corresponds to the sixth that I have in my imagination. And then once I get that interval, I can reach, I can tune it at various pitch heights. What's being described here is a relational technique of intonation, which relies on relational hearing. And this means that pitches are tuned to other pitches. These pitches may have sounded as in a melody, you know. They may be sounding. They might be about to sound, as if I give a pitch that someone else will respond to, or they might potentially sound. Um, but in any event, these pitches that we play are defined by their relationships to other pitches. They are modeled in their relationships to other pitches. And crucially, in a practice context, they are known as relational things. I'll give an example. So here we've got a common pitch that isn't likely to frighten anybody too much. We have an F, this F on the violin. Now, this is, an, this is a pitch which, if we read common practice pitch notation as, as being um, in some way analogous to the 12 equally tempered semitones of the keyboard, uh, there's not much of a question about where that pitch uh, is in pitch space. Um, however, in a string technique of intonation, which is a relational technique of intonation, we have to think about the harmonic or the, the sonor sonorific context of that pitch. So say we have that pitch uh, tuned as a third on D. It's a very different pitch than it would be if it's tuned as a seventh on G. You can 
see my little annotation here. If we tune this pitch F as a third on D in a consonant low order just intonation tuning system, it would be tuned 14% of a semitone higher than the F that would occur on the piano keyboard. And if we tune it as a natural seventh, harmonic seventh on G, it would be tuned 35% of a semitone lower than the piano keyboard. So we're talking about almost a quarter tone worth of difference here. It's not inconsequential. Even more um, meaningful in a string context is what if that F then became the tuning note that another pitch was based on. So say I, I tune uh, a B flat, a fourth above, to that F on G. I arrive at a B flat that's 37% of a semitone lower than the pitch that we would hear on a piano keyboard. It's not it's, it's, it's definitely an audible difference. It's not inconsequential in any way, and that's a very different pitch than we would arrive at had we taken the D as the initial starting tone. So this just gives an indication of how important a relational technique of intonation is in a string performance context. What we're really asking, though, when we put annotations like this into a, piece of, into a scored piece of music is how can we describe the pitches that we play? Well, it's been noted by numerous violinists, uh, numerous string players, uh, pedagogues, researchers of string technique, that intonation it seems to be an area uh, of study which under many circumstances we think it's just best to leave it alone. Violinist Götz Richter here says, after all, so the argument goes, there are plenty of excellent violinists that have not thought about this issue and yet play beautifully in tune. Do not wake the somnambulist while sleepwalking. Um, a great example of this attitude is, uh, is this statement from the, the highly influential uh, violin pedagogue Ivan Galamian, whose method of violin teaching formed sort of the backbone of American violin playing in the middle of the last century. Um, Almost anybody who has any kind of job at any North American university now either studied with Galamian or studied immediately with one of his students. For example, Dorothy DeLay, the famous Juilliard pedagogue, was Galamian's teaching assistant. Galamian wrote this about intonation. He says, eventually, the mere act of mentally preparing the movement and thinking the sound of the desired pitch will be sufficient to cause the fingers automatically to hit the right places on the strings. And I remember reading this as a student, I'm bristling a little bit, and then I read it again, um, you know, at, recently as an adult, and I thought, hang on a second. There are, there are a few problems with this. Okay, the mere act of mentally preparing the movement. What's mere about that? Thinking the sound of the pitch, okay, well, where's that where's that thinking going on will be sufficient to cause the fingers automatically okay what 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 do you mean automatically what's automatic about this to hit the right places on the string what, where are the right places as we've just as we've just seen definitions of microtonality which rely on deviation from a semitone are not broad enough to accommodate a nuanced intonation practice on this instrument. So the idea that there are right places to hit on the string and that if we deviate from them, we're somehow hitting the wrong places, a violinist could justifiably ask, you know, which are the right ones? <laughs> which pitches are the right pitches and which are therefore microtonal or extended? But this suggestion of Galamian, this description of technique from Galamian, opens up for me a, a more fundamental question which, which is relevant to any of us who are involved in embodied practice, um, which has to do with what kind of trajectories are involved when we enact any kind of technique. So it seems to me that Galamian's description here of, of, of an intonation practice of, of enacting the technique of intonation essentially comes down to 
two components, audiation leading to actualization. And it doesn't seem to me that he really considers there to be much of an event in the change between audiation and actualization. He says, we think the sound of a pitch, and that's enough to automatically cause that pitch to come into being. The fingers hit the right place, now the pitch is real. Um, maybe a more nuanced description of what Galamian's talking about here might, might be uh, shown like this. So it seems that Galamian's suggesting, okay, we have technique, and technique is something that, that we have that exists before anything is carried out. Um, and that technique is enacted in some way and it results in sounding. And as a player, we respond to that sounding by listening. And we have then two choices. We either have in tune or we have out of tune. If we're in tune, great, we can continue and we can carry out this process again. If we are out of tune, wrong, we have to fix it. Fix it. Okay, are we in tune now? Great, yes, we can go. So what we have here is a linear epistemic trajectory and one which is outcome oriented and, and which takes an acquisitional approach to technique. The idea that our technique is something we have to have a certain set of skills and once we have them, we can use them reliably and identically in each instance. Um, None of this, in fact, in any way negates the idea or the capacity of embodied knowledge. It is a rather um, oversimplified, in my view, description of what can transpire in a technique of intonation. It suggests that the technique that we have as players and acting pitch, sounding pitch on our instrument, is located primarily here in the hands, um, maybe secondarily in the mind, so we have to be able to imagine pitch. Um, and to varying extent in the ears, which are used as some kind of measure uh, which, or, or, or tool of assessment. Um, but crucially, this, this view of intonation techniques suggests that intonation technique is a means to what I would call a tautological end of playing in tune. So we have intonation technique so we can play in tune. And this in tuneness that we might attribute to a pitch or a collection of pitches is presumed to carry some kind of absolute value. Um, my own lived practice of being a violinist, being a string quartet player, and playing a wide variety of, of genres of repertoire, including what we might call microtonal music, um, was enough to convince me that, that this isn't a sufficient description of what can transpire in a technique of intonation. I began to question what what actually is going on? What's what what are what might be the components of an embodied technique of intonation? Um, so sh certainly we we do have this inactive manual component. Um, this is the component the 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 finger part <laughs> is the component that's um, overwhelmingly written about in violin pedagogy uh, over the past four hundred years. Um, you get a lot of discussion of getting the fingers to go in the right place. And it is undoubtedly a very important part, playing in tune uh, and of intonation technique. Um, equally important, I would argue, are observational technique, listening, perceiving, um, s sensory experience of the instrument, proprioceptive and haptic knowledge. Um, listening to acoustic, lis be exist existing in a space. Um, these, these observational components of technique can profoundly influence how we hear intonation. There's something else that goes on though. Um, an area of technique which is very difficult to talk about. I'm going to call it reflection, reflective technique. It's the synthesis moment where something that's being observed turns into something that could next be done, turns into some kind of sense making. Um, and I, I became very curious about trying to, trying to unpack 
what might have been involved in that reflective moment of technique, that reflective component. To quote the neuroscientist and philosopher Francis Francisco Varela, in reflection, we find ourselves in a circle. We're in a world that seems to be there before reflection begins, but that world is not separate from us. So in an epistemic cycle of intonation technique, I think that this representation might be closer to the kind of lived experience I have of playing this instrument. Now, it's crucial here to say right off the bat that just because th this uh, this little representation is in a circle, um, it could still be read as a sequence of events. For example, I, I act, I observe, I reflect, I act, I observe, um, which is once again something of a linear epistemic trajectory. And, and I think it's important that we, we register that um, these, these components of technique, they are continuant within a technique of intonation. They are, they are all going on at all points. And we, we have to some degree the choice where we rest our attention at any point in a practice of technique. Um, but these components, they don't, they don't, they don't occur in sequence. Uh, they, they emerge sometimes in, in surprising ways as we practice uh, an embodied technique. So this could be one way of, of um, representing what happens in a technique of intonation. And to once again draw on the wisdom of Ben Spatz, if technique is embodied knowledge that structures our practices, then my practice of intonation could be represented in this way. So I have my technique of intonation, I have these components of technique, and they are instantiated in various practices. So for example, I made this diagram uh, back in 2018 when I was teaching a, an ensemble performance module um, at the University of Leeds with Scott, who's here today. Um, and uh, so every Monday in Leeds, when I go and play and discuss just intervals with my string students, these elements of technique are being instantiated. Each time I perform a slip minuet of my friend Martin Arnold, the way I've come to know that piece, that practice that I've developed that piece, structured by these components of technique. When I recorded Chioko Shlavnik's Reservoir, Just Intonation and Sign Tones uh, for another timbre, these components of technique were being instantiated. Now, it was partway through my PhD and I had a nice lunch with Ben and we were talking about how technique interfaces with materials. And I realized that actually there is a component of my practice of intonation, my technique of intonation, which isn't embodied. So this, this cyclic representation might be quite a good representation of a singer's technique of intonation. In fact, my jelly bean of epistemology might be a better way of uh, representing my technique of intonation because there is this material component which has this element of agency, um, which is in many ways definitive of the technique because um, it causes me to, to, it forms my technique in specific ways which, which are needed in order to have a relationship with this, this instrument. Now, I found this representation of intonation technique much more satisfying than, than the kind of linear epistemic trajectory that was suggested by that quote of Galamian. Um, but I still felt that there were some aspects of this, this top category, reflection, um, which needed to be kind of, kind of dug into a bit. So um, I started thinking about all of the different influences on the practices of intonation that I have. Um, and at the same time, I, I was, I was uh, reading a lot of, of criticism of um, criticism of, of text and notation uh, by people like uh, Seth Kim Cohen and Salome Vogelin, who were saying things like uh, notation is an obstacle to pure sensorial engagement with sound, things like this. And, and I started thinking, okay, but my artistic practice is primarily in, in 
performance involving some forms of notation by other people. So I have to take a bit more of a generous view to notation. So how might notation come into this reflective imagination component of technique? And I realized that the reflective moment in an epistemic cycle of technique, in fact, kind of is its own little cycle. Um, in, in Ben's book, What a Body Can Do, they have this really nice line, um, which I always remember, about how technique involves this, this exchange between socially defined symbolic meanings and the concrete possibilities offered by the material world. And I, I thought, well, that's a pretty good description of me entering into engagement with some kind of notation with my instrument. Um, there's a cycle that goes on between the material agency, the needs, the predilections, the, the, the bossiness, the unpredictability, the material indeterminacy of this violin that I play, and these sort of uh, culturally defined uh, meanings that, that, that are communicated to me and that activate my oral imagination in, in the notation of the composers whose music I play. Um, and that this little, little dialectic ha has the effect of, of really, really activating my imagination. And it's that activation of my oral imagination that leads me to be able to audiate pitch in the way that I do. I'm able to hear an interval in this way or tune a pitch in this way because I've done it before many times. Um, so when I think about that reflective moment of technique, I think that it, it really includes those components in a kind of relational space of its own. So to answer my question about what is intonation technique, well, I would say that intonation technique is embodied knowledge of pitch space that defines how I practice musical pitch. These these pushy little things here, they tend to obscure that question. What are these then in the context of an intonation technique? I'd suggest firstly that these, these symbols, these four ways of writing a major third, they furnish socially defined and symbolic meaning that can activate my oral imagination. And these notations crucially can, can produce identical renderings. So here I have four ways of notating major third. I have a just third, the five over four interval. I have a, a notation involving scent deviations. Uh, I have a qualitative description, a pure, clean, beatless, resonant tone. And I have a common practice, five line staff notation, major third. All of these can produce exactly the same interval. It sounds like this. A second to get it. If they can produce identical renderings, they are eliciting common pathways of technique, and therefore they must be interchangeable as material in my practice. Each will define its own practice context. So I find the description of notation given by Lely and Saunders in their book Word Events, which was actually um, directed toward verbal notation, but I think it works just as well for um, microtonal pitch notation. I find this to be very useful in this context. Notations can be regarded not as a collection of fixed meanings, but rather as structured meaning potentials, which are sensitive to context. In terms of the practical realization of scores, we could regard the score as stru a structured meaning potential, which is sensitive to context, and anyone, any realization of that score could be considered not just as one of a limited number of possible outcomes, but rather as an instantiation of the structured meaning potential of the score. So if we think about our four descriptions of a major third here, you know, we've got four very clearly defined practice contexts. We have a just intonation practice context, a practice context that requires dividing the semitone into a hundred equal further parts. We have one that requires having some kind of 
shared understanding of what pure, clean, beatless or resonant means. And we've got this strange shorthand of pitch notation, 12, five line staff notation that we all have known since children. Each defines a practice context, but within each of these notations, we might have not a limited number of possible outcomes, but the potential for these to unfold in a number of ways, which each would be a valid instantiation of the structured meaning potential of that notation. So in this context, I can answer my question about what microtonality is. So I would say that microtonality is any or all of the various interrelated embodied and or semantic practices through which pitch is modeled in the making of music. And crucially, a string player's embodied practices of microtonality are structured by their technique of intonation. I remember telling some students um, at Goldsmiths this, and they they were a bit, they were they felt a bit let down because they said, "Wait, so isn't uh, what you're saying is micro all this microtonal stuff is just more tuning?" <laughs> said, yeah, sorry, <laughs> it is. Um, to view this another way, uh, we could borrow a line from the sociologist Karin Norsatina, one of my favorite um, people to read at the moment. Um, Norse Tina says, a stable name is not an expression or indicator of stable thinghood. Rather, when we name, as we have done here by calling this third a five over four or giving it scent deviations, um, it's a way to punctuate flux, to bracket and ignore difference, to declare them as pointing to an identity for a particular purpose. Or as Sally Jane Norman has said, there are things that I want to do with notation and there are things that I want it to do for me. Now, that's brought me sort of to the end of my, um, my little uh, microtonal rant. I think when we, when we look at uh, this diagram of, of, of a technique of intonation, the, the thing that, that I often still remark on is that the whole point of playing an instrument, the, the whole point of having an artistic practice in music, the sounding part, is actually here outside of, outside of, the, of the epistemic cycle. So that sometimes is a, a point of contention uh, for people. When, when I talk to them about this idea, but I, I think that we can come back to this idea of instantiation, the idea that any possible realization is an instantiation of the potential meaning of something. And when I think about enacting a technique of intonation, I think about how uh, every time I play, no matter how predictable or how uh, well entrained or how sedimented uh, the work, the technique that I am using has become in me, there will always be these moments of, of, um, of startling realization, these ruptures um, in my practice. And it's led me to consider my, um, my artistic practices, which I'll share some, some documentation now. Um, I, I think about them not as interpretations or as performances, but as what I call instances of practice. Um, I call, I think about my performances in this way um, because I don't view them as complete and I don't view them as self-contained assertions of my artistic perspective. I think about them as documentations of specific instances where my embodied knowledge has been put to use, instantiated. And so um, they, they can neither be viewed as concrete positions that exclude other renderings. Um, I view them as, as, as what Norsetina calls epistemic objects, which have emerged from the research that I've done and which crucially provoke me to continue researching, to continue trying things, to continue my experiments. All right, so I have a couple of pieces of work that I could share, but maybe it's worth just pausing there um, to see if there are any questions about that so far. Um, what do you think, Emily? Uh, should we, should I share some instances of practice now or should, would you like to take questions first or? Um, I think it would be great to, to see some, some 
your examples of practice first and then maybe open up to questions afterwards if that's okay with you yeah absolutely um okay well so i have a couple of um examples to show um the first is a piece that i recorded um for another timbre a couple of years back it's a piece that i commissioned uh, from the composer james weeks the piece is called windfell um i'll just show you actually uh, right might be worth showing some examples of hang on there we go um, yeah i'll do this Once more. here's an example of um of some of the scores and i'm going to play a short oh I'm having I'm having some just a second sorry guys I'm having some technology trouble um, I think what I'll do is this slightly lo-fi low-tech but um yeah here we go can you see that Emily uh, yep, I can see a YouTube window in front of me and also, yeah, the score on the left. Great, brilliant. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to play a short clip. Uh, it's about three minutes long from YouTube. Um, this is from the disc and it gives a, a sense of a, a few of the different kinds of musical textures that are in the piece. So here we go.
Okay, so it's a 60 minute piece. That's just a very brief excerpt um, that show a few of the, of the different uh, of the sections in the piece. Um, as you could see from the, from the little section of score that was on my slide, um, it uses very um, specific microtonal pitch notation drawn from um, 11 limit, 7 and 11 limit just intonation notation and it uses the Mark Sabat's um, Helmholtz Ellis extended just intonation pitch notation uh, to communicate that. Um, but it's, it's based on, on really um, uh, on this idea that of tunable intervals that we can intervals that we can hear and tune and identify by ear. So what's interesting about this piece for me from the perspective of of uh, this research into into intonation and microtonality as an embodied practice. Um, when we just get back to my slide there we go. When we when we when we see scores like this as as uh, as practitioners, we often put ourselves in a position of of needing to to kind of achieve a very great precision in the in the tuning, and we often employ aids like chromatic tuners. And uh, in my my discussions with James Weeks, the composer, um, it became apparent that 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 was not what this was for him. Um, there's this nice little quote here in gray from James, he says, the point of using just intonation is that the intervals are tunable. They're embodied as it were. I can hear them under my ear. I can feel them in my gut. They are for me material things, not abstractions, not ideas about interval size. They're tunable things. And he says, I wouldn't sit in a recording session with my tuner. There's, there's a zone of right enough for me, but what I'm looking for is, is material that's graspable. Um, what I like about it is that I can hear it all. This, these discussions I had with James, they really gave me permission to, to foreground my, my embodied experience, um, my, my technical experience as a, sort of, as a sort of unfolding of this relationship, this knowledge that I have of pitch space through this relationship with the instrument. Um, the things about this practice that that I felt really moved this research on, the things that I carry forward, um, is that when I think about developing an interpretation of this piece, any elements of personalizing that might come out in, 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 or be brought into a practice of Winfell are not a matter of intervening, intervening in the tuning. They're not about making decisions about, oh, Maybe I'll tune this interval a little differently because I think it should sound in this way. They're about engaging in a sustained and rigorous practice of listening. Um, and for me, it's in this internal ref reflective process that the kind of um, the, the, the learning comes out. So I think about this not as being a piece that's about being in tune. I think about it as being a piece that's about tuning the listening that I do in this piece, in fact, surfaces as the primary carrier of content. So perhaps counterintuitively in the presence of so many specific notations to do with microtonal pitch, it's not about controlling intonation, it's about participating in the tuning of this piece. So I really felt that in, in developing a practice of, of Windfell, I was the one that was being tuned, not it. <laughs> And it was tuning me, and I felt that this really, this really um, centered my lived experience as the site of the practice. It made any possible instance of practice of this piece uh, not something that I needed to measure or compare um, by some kind of you know metric or by by use of a, an electronic tuning measurement. Uh, it was about unfolding this practice again and again and developing a, a more of a sense of myself being tuned. So, so this is one, one instance of practice which I felt um, moved the research forward. Um, bringing this idea of, of, uh, of centering, centering my lived self as the place where the, where the tuning was going on, I, I could also share um, 
a short excerpt of a really nice piece by Scott McLaughlin. Uh, Scott's here, so you can chime in if you want, Scott. Um, I'll just grab the video. Um, this is a, a, a long piece, The Endless Mobility of Listening, um, which, unlike uh, Windfell, doesn't have any specific microtonal notation and doesn't, in fact, even use the left hand. Um, it's a piece that involves um, what Scott, uh, a technique that Scott calls drone bowing, which I can demonstrate to you here. It's basically a technique of bowing the string um, against the sounding point until um, the, the fundamental pitch breaks and partial content emerges. <laughs> The zoom sound is probably woefully inadequate, but you could hear that the, the fundamental pitch did split and partials were allowed to emerge. Um, this is the, the recording that I'll share, uh, just a very brief section of, uh, is 15 minutes long. The piece in, in totality lasts about 75 minutes, but um, I'll play just a minute from the beginning, a minute from partway through, and a minute close to the end so you can hear how, how this uh, capturing and layering of these various partials results in a kind of build-up effect of the harmonic overtones of the piece. So here we go.
All right. So as you can see um, from this nice uh, kind of graphic that Scott's made, um, the, the piece involves a, a process of, of, of layering of these captured um, partials that emerge from the string using three processes, the tuning process, which you heard, the process which we call seeking and capturing, where a partial is captured and frozen by a live looping patch, and then a short section of chorale to kind of delineate the harmonic texture at the end of each section. Um, and, and here we, we are exploring both this idea of, of the sort of physical technique of drone bowing, and also this idea of material agency, the relationship between the inactive bodies uh, technique, exertion of agency over the instrument and the, the agency that the violin itself has as a material object. Um, the really interesting thing about this piece um, is that there's a very high degree of, of, uh, of unpredictability uh, with the technique, which introduces um, what I consider to really be a privilege uh, the privilege of becoming a curious listener to your own practice. Um, as, as this little diagram shows, at any point in the piece, I might, I might choose to capture the, this... Uh, oh, I didn't say, actually, it's quite important to, to recognize. At, at, all, at all times, there's a goal of capturing this B5 harmonic. Um, but the idea here, of course, in, in the piece is that that doesn't always transpire because of the nature of the indeterminacy of the technique. So at any given time, uh, in this process, I might hear that partial that I'm supposed to capture, um, choose to capture it, and I might actually manage to. Equally, I might choose to capture it, but not manage to, and I get something else. Um, I might uh, decide I want to hear something different, so I might not capture that partial and continue seeking. I might not hear the B, but like what I've found, so I can capture that instead. I might not hear the B, but like what I hear, and so I choose to capture it instead, but I don't manage to, and I get something else. Or I might not hear the B and not like what I hear, so I keep seeking. So I'm involved in this kind of constant reflective um, listening practice surrounding hearing the relationships between pitches that are sounding, that are emerging from the instrument, and that, that have already been frozen by the live looping pat. How this relates to this idea of intonation technique, I mean, is it intonation technique? There, there were, aside from the chorale sections, there weren't really any fingers involved. Um, I, f I find this piece uh, provides for me what I think of as a reframing of intonation technique, which places an emphasis on the non-manual, the non-inactive aspect. So, you know, I was before I, I was critical of the idea that that so much attention is given to where the fingers fall and these ideas of observation and reflection as components of technique are often downplayed uh, in, in uh, string pedagogy. Well, here, by, by, by making observable those components of listening and synthesizing a, a sort of harmonic, a feeling of, of position in harmonic space, um, the live looping patch makes these components observable, enabling, enabling me to interact on an explicit and relational level with my own intonation technique, with decisions I've made in previous iterations uh, of, the, of the process. And um, into, these integral parts of technique become externalized and foregrounded so that others can hear them and, and they become thus the main carriers of content in the piece. So I feel that this practice um, is very well sort of very well characterized by this lovely little statement of Karn Norsetina um, about how a practice like this is always in the process of being materially redefined and thus its objects, its epistemic objects, the, 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 the knowledge objects that emerge from it continually acquire new properties, change the ones that they have. Um, and this is my main takeaway of, of, of having done this wonderful collaboration with Scott, is that this practice of intonation, which almost doesn't involve me controlling any pitch heights at all, is nonetheless very much a practice of intonation. Um, 
the surface dissimilarity of this practice from, say, something like the piece of James Weeks, which involves such specific fingering patterns, um, masks a very profound epistemological conjunction that unites these as practices of intonation. All right, <laughs> there we are. I think I've said enough. Um, Emily, would you like to uh, invite questions? Um, would any, is anyone? Yeah, definitely. Um, please, um, it'd be great to have some questions from the floor. Do feel free to pop your camera on um, or not, if, if there are reasons you prefer not to. Uh, you can use the raise hand um, option if you uh, just down in reactions down at the bottom, you should see an option to raise a hand or um, hey, just unmute yourself and go if no one else is speaking. Um, and if not, I'll kick off the discussion with something I'm mulling over. Um, Mira, I'm just checking because you're down as a host here. I, I don't. Uh, I, I'll keep looking, but just in case I missed anyone's hand up. Should um, I make you sure I the this. host, Emily? Now, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, because I think I think that that affects how I see hands raised and things. Okay. Um, be a good idea. Um, while you're doing that, so while you're talking, I was thinking of what you're saying, um, how you're describing your practice, and um, and how it how these these ideas of technique f feed into your the, essentially the artistic outputs of your work, um, and it was making me think about how the notion of creativity and I guess if we think of the sort of early phases what we might think of as the kind of the early phases of defining practice research um, you know in the in the past maybe decade two decades a little longer um, there's often been an, a, a strong emphasis on on research content, but also on the idea of creativity being to do with creating things that are radically new and a break from what they're doing something no one has done before this kind of, you know, I guess also this sort of slightly modernist notion of, of um, uh, what counts as, as new in music and in contemporary music. And I was wondering how, how what you feel about that, um, about the sort of the, the dialogue between that idea on the one hand of, of creativity being newness and on the other hand, the centrality in the practice you're describing, I think in a lot of artistic practice of it being more about refining and re-experiencing and, and, um, and developing from the point of view of your own experience of what you're doing about, about that being a central focus of, of what we do rather than constantly trying to prove that we're doing something different all the time. Mm. This sort of more reflective element of it, I guess. Um, yeah, I, if you have any thoughts around that sort of. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. I think that it's interesting because I, I, I could kind of take, I could answer the question in one way relating to um, the practice of intonation technique on, on, the, on the instrument that I play, the violin, and in a very different way in relation to the practice of contemporary music. And I think, I think when it comes to being a violinist, um, all of these techniques, which I kind of have been exploring, um, I, I approached them, I arrived at them as part of an experimental practice of being a, a sort of, of playing microtonal music. Uh, they are in fact the same techniques which have been used since Tartini's research in 1750 when he, when the violinist um, and theorist Tartini identified difference tones. Um, and I think that the fact that these these techniques have not changed in that time reflect the 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 enduring quality of 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 technique which is related in the materiality of the instrument it's it's rooted in the in the in the material essence of of this instrument which also hasn't changed since that time um so in that respect um there isn't much that's new. There's only a kind of depth of engagement to be gained in in our in our experience of it. How, how that's how that's then translated, or how that may may have an impact on on the field of contemporary and or experimental music. Um, I mean, the the two the two uh, instances of practice that I chose to share were collaborations with just people very dear to me just very much co-creative projects um and I, I think 
they they describe as much the the musical relationship between myself and those two composer creators as as they they do about music so i i don't know if that answers your question but i think in 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 both senses um it, yeah it's about it's about being in a practice context does does that make sense yeah yeah completely i think i think what sort of what I feel like is, is coming across from your work is is this idea of um, the aspect of, of being a being a creative artist, which is to do with a sort of a journey inward, and it's to do with connecting with people mm. um, rather than purely being defined by the production of of superficially new outputs. I guess it's 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 this kind of more it's more kind of yeah it, perhaps introspective, but perhaps kind of reflective, connective aspect of what we do. Which is yeah. which is perhaps not been as well served in discussions around around artistic practice as, as other aspects. I mean, um, as as a performer, you know, I tried to, I always try to use that word performer as as infrequently as possible because I don't really think of myself as a performer. Um, I think of myself as a practitioner. Um, performances are are pra are one kind of practice, or part of practice, I suppose. Um, but I think this idea of creativity or individuation in a performance, the idea that we have to kind of put out an artistic perspective in performance. I think that's very much, for me, the idea that, that a performance needs to be some kind of unique or, or self-contained artistic perspective, it, that, rely, that perspective relies on, on the idea that a performance is a something that's finished. And the entire reason that I decided to come back to education and, and, and get involved in practice research is because I realized as a performer of string quartet music, we'd give the performance and, and you know, in many, for many performers, that you're, that's the thing that you've aimed to do. That's the, the end result. For me, I realized when I would do those performances that it wasn't the end of anything, it was an opening to something. And so I needed to, do this thing called practice research because it's it's starting something for me I think so maybe that's the answer to the question um Ben uh Ben has a question or a comment I do have or a question yeah and then there's another one that appeared in the chat too but let me start um so I want to ask you about pitch space which I find a really fascinating idea that you mentioned a few times and um as you know, I'm coming from a background of embodied practice around singing. And so there is some overlap um, in terms of, particularly in that windless piece there, you know, there's something that when you, there were, you were vocalizing and there's a lot of, you know, so I'm resonating a lot with, with, with the kind of the direction that you're moving, but I don't have any background in musical notation. And I guess I'm asking about the relationship between notation and pitch space and the idea of space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of, mathematization it seems to me which is shared by most if not all of the notation systems you showed so for example uh you know there's the, the musical bar with its kind of fixed uh you know they they're use their letters but they're essentially numerical intervals and then that can be replaced by these actually more mathematical pythagorean intervals or these otherwise mathematical sense which are you know then they have a plus 14 and all of this is still, you know, it's it's suggesting that although they may be relational or they may be um, partial or decimal, there is this pitch, which is this. It's essentially an, a number. It's it's almost like you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a thing. It's a kind of single point. And even in the idea of space, pitch space is coming from. I mean, I know it from Manuel de Landa and I, I don't remember where he gets it, but it's like phase space, like mapping possibilities of things in the material world. But you can only do that when you um, reduce them to a particular set of mathematized dimensions. And that for me is still a little bit in tension with embodied practice where despite, uh, you know, and, and well, notwithstanding the, the great attempts of, um, like MRI machines and um, motion capture, all these things to to mathematize 
the body, it, it doesn't really work that way. There isn't, you know, there aren't numbered gestures or anything like that. So I, I, I would like to know if you, if you relate to pitch space as how mathematical is, is this idea of pitch space? How unitary is the, is the very idea of pitch for you? Like there's a pitch and there might be a, a partial, but are we, are we talking about things that are um, measurable in that way? Or, or what about those, um, I guess the, when you were using English descriptive words, that was going in a very different direction, like sweet. Um, that's, that's not mathematical. So what is the quality of pitch space? How mathematical is it? And the, the parts that are not mathematical, how do you, how, you know, is, how do you move in them? Move is the word. Um, I think the numbers are, I think the numbers and the symbols are red herrings to a large extent. It, I mean, it's anytime you want to identify your location or your coordinates in a space, numbers are useful um, as, as way of triangulating yourself. Um, and, and I think, um, though, that th these various notations, which, which I've shown, which are, are the most common notations that I, I'm used to using, they, they, they have their schemas, they, they bring their metrics, and they have their practice contexts, and they're useful in various they're useful variously at various points depending on the kind of material that we're using but the crucial point about any of these notation practices is that for a person who becomes familiar with them they 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 have a they serve a function of immediately activating the oral imagination so when i see like a minus 14 my holistically intertwined organism here becomes activated because I know the sound, the sensation, the feeling, and the, the how to play a justly tuned third, because I, I, I can read that notation. And I think that really these numbers that we're talking about and any of these forms of notation, they're just a system of, of text that if you know how to read them, then they become material that can be eaten and digested in an embodied practice. Um, so there are some people who really like notation and choose to focus on um, notation as the kind of foregrounded element of practice, and that's, that's cool for them. Um, and for me, in my practice, the notation it, it becomes useful when it can be, when it can, it becomes useful at the point where it becomes a, a sort of stimulant to the oral imagination. And then pitch, it, pitch is about proximity. It's, pitch is entirely about distance and proportion. So it's a extremely physical and kind of gestural and spatial experience, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we had a question in the chat from uh, Zhao Pires. Um, would you like, uh, Zhao, would you like to ask a question or um, uh, I guess we can read it if that's easier, but do feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask it verbally if you prefer. So Joe's yes. question is about um, uh, gestures and how it relates to form, uh, how intonation relates to performance gestures. Ah, I'd love to hear a little more about your take on performance gestures. You've talked about intonation and how it relates to the performance gestures. Have you thought about other instrumental performance gestures? What do you mean by performance gestures? I'm curious. Could you say a bit more about that? Uh, Joe just said he doesn't have the uh, equipment to um, ah. uh, to video chat so um that's okay um i can try to answer the question i mean gesture is a very um gestures pretty much as in actions in performance ah you mean the physicality of playing 
Um, I su well, I don't think of gesture as in any way performative. Like, I don't think about making gestures for performative effect. If I, that's probably fairly self-evident with the repertoire I play. It's really still a lot of it. Um, but I think, I think that when it, I think that much of, much of the, the practices surrounding tuning, they're, they're very, they're very personal in some, in, in many ways, private experiences, which you can make available to others in a public context. But for me, the, the gesture always serves the function of continuing the sounding because I want to listen. So it's this idea that I'm as much a curious listener to these practices as, as any, anyone else who happens to be in the room, whether that's, you know, like somebody walking down a corridor hearing me through a door, or maybe if I'm standing on a stage playing, I'm doing this thing that, that's centered around listening and, and the kind of creativity and individuation of that experience is, is, is in the kind of moments of rupture that occur in that listening that finding that James Weeks was talking about, kind of seeking out and just touching and tasting the, the sounds. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question. I, I, it would be nice to talk to you about this, but for me, anything that's gestural in terms of my embodied movements, they just, they're entirely focused toward the needs of the instrument, especially in Scott McLaughlin's piece. Scott's actually asked a question here. Come in if you want, Scott, but in Scott's piece, the, the technique of the piece is the thing that was composed. And in some sense, that that's the composition process, and then it just kind of is let to unfold. And so it's all about keeping that technique, which is very tenuous in balance and attending to that. So you're kind of supporting that technique to come out. So it's, it's yeah, very much in, in service of the sound, I suppose. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Um, ben says, Scott says, where are we? I've lost track in the pitch. Scott, you had a question about pitch face. Do you want to come in if you're there? Scott says his Wi-Fi is, is very bad, um, okay. but he did ask, um, repitch space makes me think of orienteering where you use numerical grid references to orient a stable references, but activity you undertake is much relational because um, in Bodied materiality underpins action. Scott's comment there in the chat. Uh, Lisa has a hand up with a question. Hello, Lisa. Hello, hi. Sorry, I'm just going to move that. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question. Actually, I wrote the question down before people asked their questions, and then I realized it was sort of related to uh, what other people were saying. Um, similar to when I come from like a local practice background um, and I wanted to ask you a question about um, about the, the, you talk about being engaged in the listening towards this microtonality and there's a there are kind of relationships that exist you know hourly with the sound and with the with your own body in relationship to the instrument and the music and so on and your and your notations and I just wanted to ask a question about the audience and whether you felt that the presence of the audience had any impact or influence on the on the microtonality and and on the uh, whether they were whether they were engulfed in your listening in, a, in any way or whether it was just about you and the instrument and the listening and the the sound or whether you in performance were able to uh, kind of fold in the audience as part of that listening and process that's an interesting question i mean my immediate response is no not at all it doesn't matter if they're there i think the thing i think that um i love the idea that music is something that could be made available to people um the 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 kind of um, mentality that I find myself in when I'm doing this kind of music, which involves a sort of very immersive listening experience to these relationships between pitches, is one that benefits from 
um, kind of what Philip Thomas has, has kind of described as sort of doing a job of work. Like you just get to it and you just, you just do the thing you're there to do. And in a way it's a bit utilitarian and in a way it's extremely kind of mystical and, but it's, it's not different if someone walks into the room. Um, actually, I work with my students in, in performance um, at Goldsmiths on, on an exercise which I call the membrane, which is all about defining a, a private space that's inside a shared space. I, I use it as a way of helping them deal with performance anxiety. But in fact, this came out of, of this experience of performing Windfell. I realized what I was doing was removing a lot of the kind of idea of resistance of the performance situation, which doesn't help me in any way. Um, and, and getting all of that out of the way f for me to just be very clear in that space and, and be able to, to listen to the material of sound. And actually, I find the performance situation extremely relaxing uh, with that outlook. And people are kind of, I'm really happy that people are there, but they could also leave. I don't know. If, I don't mean that to sound rude, but um, yeah. This is not performative work in the sense that it is about projecting some kind of idea of work. It's kind of like uh, I was once um, described by an opera teacher. Uh, it, I saw a masterclass in opera talking about the difference between pretending to do an action on stage and actually just doing that action on stage. And I think about this very much as the latter. Yeah. What's the, what would be the auditory version of witness? Like witness is to do with sight, but what would, what would be a word that was to do with audition, with listening? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, aside from the word audience, of course. <laughs> But I mean, to get away from like the side of the audience coming to, to see you for something rather than being, you know, being witnessed. In French, you say assister, assister, to assist in a concert. That's like going to a concert. I think it's kind of nice. Um, I don't know, when I was thinking about that component of embodied technique, I just used observation because it's a kind of full on sensory reception isn't it? But it's an interesting one. Yeah, I don't know what I would use for that. Other people have ideas. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It's really interesting to talk. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, so we've come up to our, uh, the end of our advertised scheduled um, duration. So I think that would probably be a nice place to wrap it up by saying a huge thank you to Mira oh, for thanks. a fascinating journey through uh, practice and um, perhaps um, uh, a real or, or virtual round of applause would be in order.